I'm Lisa Schwartz. I'm a psychologist at CHOP at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And I work primarily with adolescents and young adults, um, both on treatment and long-term survivors. So I'm really thrilled to be able to um, talk with everybody tonight about some of the challenges associated with adolescents and young adults, and in particular, parenting adolescents and young adults with cancer or who survived cancer. Um, and a few issues of business to discuss. Um, we have a moderated chat available to you during the presentation. So feel free to use the chat function to connect with each other. Um, and you can also submit your questions um, using the chat window. And questions won't be published right away. We'll wait till um, pauses throughout the talk to, to answer some of the questions. So I always like to start a talk about um, uh, adolescents and young adults with cancer by this quote. Um, cancer is not just a single event with a certain end, but an enduring condition characterized by ongoing uncertainty, potentially delayed or late effects of disease or treatment and concurrent psychosocial issues. So it really speaks to the long-term journey um, of cancer, especially as it relates to adolescents and young adults and their families. Uh, so tonight, as I talk about adolescents and young adults, I'm going to be talking both about AYA, as I refer to them, um, on treatment and also off treatment. So in terms of some general statistics, we know that 21,400 AYA between the ages of 15 and 29 were diagnosed with cancer in 2000. So, um, in, sorry for the old statistics, uh, but it's nearly three times that of patients diagnosed in the 15 years of life, and the numbers are pretty consistent today. Um, and 80% uh, will survive approximately into adulthood. <clears throat> and to give you some background on adolescents and young adults, so AYA, uh, I want to just talk generally about how challenging this time period is in general, um, and then we'll talk more about how uh, cancer adds challenge to that, both for the patient and also for the family. So I like to think of this time as being characterized by me, so M-E-E-E-E -E -E continued. Um, so there's many, many transitions and changes happening during this time period, certainly physical, cognitive, social, and emotional. There's also the emergence of goal setting and pursuit, which is a primary task of adolescence and young adulthood. There's also exploration in terms of exploration of goals, of identity, of interests, um, certainly egocentrism, um, erratic behavior. Uh, so there's still a sense of dysregulation, both in terms of their behavior and their emotions. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and the time of expected health. So. AYA really ex don't expect to be sick. Parents don't expect them to be sick. It's really a time where we think of them as invincible. And so I'm going to break this down and talk a little bit more about the health, cognitive aspects, psychosocial and developmental aspects of AYA. So as I said, most AYAs are healthy. They feel invincible. Really the only um, issue with uh, their physical health is growth and puberty and the associated biological changes, which usually are, are not problematic. Um, it's also a period where they're at risk because of their behaviors. Um, they're engaged in new activities. They like to explore substances, risk-taking behaviors. And actually, the leading cause of death for um, adolescents is unintentional injury. So in general, they have few reasons to go to the doctor, and um, it's a time where they can start to begin to assume responsibility for their health, but really it's, it's not an issue that they need to focus on. Um, insurance and access can also be an issue for this age group, but again, usually it's not an issue because they're relatively healthy. Um, we know now from neuroscience that adolescents and young adults still have immature brains. So there's aspects of the brain that really don't mature until middle, um, around your middle 20s. 
So, for example, the frontal lobes are not fully mature until young adulthood. And also the way the brain processes emotions is different in childhood and adolescence relative to um, later in, in young adulthood. So what are the implications? Um, Adolescents and young adults may be emotionally reactive, um, and teens especially process emotions different than adults. Um, they have not fully developed abstract thinking, ability to, to look into the future, understand consequences, um, and, their, uh, and the ability to, to engage in executive functioning, so the idea where you can multitask, um, think of multiple different scenarios at once, problem solve effectively. All of those skills really aren't fully developed until um, your 20s for most people. And they also have a harder time, prior, um, or, or I'm sorry, they also are more likely to prioritize short-term goals over long-term goals. Now, over time, as AYA um, develop into their 20s, this all changes. So not only is their brain maturing, but they've had chances to practice new cognitive skills. So practicing skills with coping and problem solving, um, becoming more proficient at abstract thinking, and they're also acquiring life experiences. So in the context of cancer, when we think about an adult who has to deal with cancer either for themselves or, or a close family member or friend, they've had they typically have had life experiences up until that point where they where they know about cancer, they understand the implications of it, um, they feel like it's something maybe not that they can relate to, but that but they understand um, the the complexity of the problem. And for um, an AYA. A, any pediatric cancer patient, they may not have those life experiences or the cognitive wherewithal to really understand the implications. But as I said, they're, they're developing those skills as they transition from adolescence to adulthood. And then in terms of psychosocial well-being, um, certainly this is a time of stress and conflict. So um, stress is typically uh, heightened during adolescence and the transition to adulthood, whether it's stress with relationships or school or long-term goals. Um, conflict with family and friends is certainly a given. And also keep in mind that mental illness is an issue. Um, the age group of 18 to 25 year olds is the demographic of the, with the highest prevalence of mental illness. So when when I say the demographic, we think are older, younger demographics, um, male, female, um, different race, ethnicities. If you narrow that down, the, as I said, the demographic with the highest prevalence of mental illness is this age group of transition to adulthood years. Um, so 8% meet criteria for a diagnosis of um, a psychiatric diagnosis. And often these problems go untreated. And then finally, development. So as I mentioned earlier, this time period is really a period where setting goals and pursuing them is critical. So adolescents and young adults are becoming autonomous in establishing their own identity, their own desires, their own long-term plans. Um, and, and that's in the domains of education, career, intimate relationships, um, either with friends or romantic partners, um, individuation and identity development, and certainly there's that aspect of individuation, especially from your family of origin with regards to living situation, finances, emotional dependency. All right, so you add cancer to the mix and it complicates everything. So I like to, to discuss this with um, patients and families and I say, being an adolescent or young adult and going through that transition to adulthood period is hard enough on its own, and then you add cancer, and it, it just makes things so much more complicated, and it can certainly exacerbate already existing problems, whether it's problems with stress, mental illness, parent-child relationships, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and to further add to the burden, we know from lots of research that um, 
relative to older, younger patients, the AYA age group is relatively underserved and under-researched, and they have significant unmet needs um, uh, uh, to, to help get them through the journey. In terms of uh, consequences during or after treatment, um, you know, if you go back and think about the developmental tasks that are important for AYA in terms of um, school and setting goals and thinking of a career and developing intimate relationships, all of that is really hindered uh, with, the, with cancer and the cancer treatment. Um, and also, uh, self-esteem and body image as well. And then, of course, for parents, things change. Um, so you may become more protective, less consistent in your parenting style, shift in roles among parents and other family members, certainly lost income and issues um, with your partner may be, become a concern. And you as parents are limiting your time at work and with friends. And I just wanted to reiterate that these outcomes, uh, these developmental outcomes for long-term survivors um, can persist. So relative to controls and siblings, we know that long-term survivors do continue to have some difficulties achieving some of the, the milestones that I mentioned. So having satisfying relationships, um, satisfaction with body, um, academic and employment achievement, et cetera. All right, so now what? Um, so you face a diagnosis of cancer with an already complicated um, adolescent and young adult patient. And what's typically the case, and I know this anecdotally, and certainly the literature supports it, is that parents are in survival mode. And the AYA are focused on just being normal. Um, and sometimes that's adaptive and sometimes those goals can compete with one another. So I wanna break this down and review some more of the specific challenges. <clears throat> and we'll just pause for a minute for some questions. All right. And it's great that you guys are asking questions already. Um, so one person wrote, I have a 17 year old son who just relapsed. We are hopefully heading to BMT soon, bone marrow transplant. How much do I push him in physical activity, keeping in touch with friends, et cetera, to keep him active? We are staying in an apartment far from home, so his high school friends are not able to visit easily. Okay, so actually I'm gonna, this is a really good question. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this. Um, and you know that my quick answer is it's really important to stay engaged with friends, um, even at a very minimal level, and to to try and stay engaged in some physical activity. But I am going to talk more about that, so we can come back to that. All right, and then how can I differentiate between stress of treatment and normal seventh grade mood swings? Um, so that's a really good question, and. You know, my thought is um, a couple things. You know, I think this is a case where communication is really important. Um, trying to see if your seventh grader has any insight into why he may be having mood swings, what are triggers. Um, you could certainly monitor, um, you know, write down track if you have a sense of what's causing the triggers, you know, which may not be obvious to you at first, but if you record um, some observations of your child's behavior, you might be able to have some insight into that. Um, and, you know, at the same time, I, you know, I, I'd be curious to know what the motivation is for understanding what the trigger is. Um, because in both cases, it it's, could be potentially really normal. So we know that seventh graders are gonna have mood swings. They're emotionally labile. Um, and at the same time, it's really normal for a seventh grader to deal with, you know, to, to 
have mood swings because of the stress of treatment. So I think part of it is really important to help normalize and validate those behaviors and um, feelings of the child. But certainly if it's impacting relationships, impacting schoolwork, um, if it's leading to aggression, then it's definitely something to be addressed. Move on. All right, so, um, so, so we're gonna go, we're gonna go back and talk about some of these um, aspects of of AYA and um, how cancer is impacting them, and in turn impacting your ability to parent your child. Okay, so AYA on treatment. Um, we know they carry a really large burden, especially relative to older and younger patients. So their treatments are often more intense and last longer. And we also know that they tend to experience pain, nausea, nausea and fatigue at higher rates um, and with more intensity than older, younger patients. So that toxicity is really an issue for them. Um, and in some cases, it's just the reason for that is not obvious. And it really challenges uh, medical providers in terms of how to treat that, you know, especially when they're used to treating pediatric patients. Um, and they may have a patient with a pediatric cancer, but with an adult body that's reacting to um, the treatments differently than one of their younger patients. So it, it really does challenge um, providers, this is uh, this is a known issue um, um, in the world of adolescent and young adult cancer. Um, and of course, to complicate matters, many of the treatments um, make the patients feel worse, and may also clearly um, exacerbate mood or um, behavior difficulties. So, of course, um, steroids is one example of that. All right, so some things to consider when you're facing this. Um, you know, one thing I see a lot as a psychologist is people confusing symptoms of these symptoms, so extreme fatigue, pain, nausea, with symptoms of depression or anxiety. And sometimes it's difficult to tease apart. Um, they're certainly intertwined. Um, you know, the, the physical symptoms can exacerbate the mood and behavior problems, and the mood and behavior problems can exacerbate the physical symptoms. Um, I actually tend to, to give the patients the benefit of the doubt because I do know how, how miserable they often feel. So really, if they probably feel that bad if they're moaning and sleeping and not functioning. Um, and certainly, if you feel that bad, it's not, you know, it's not surprising if a patient ends up feeling depressed and anxious on top of that. So I think it's really important as a parent um, who knows your child best to really follow your instincts. And if you think that what your child is experiencing is really these extreme physical symptoms that um, that need to be treated, then certainly advocate on your child's behalf. Um, and in the meantime, it's always helpful to have psychosocial support staff to help the patient through those symptoms um, in you know more coping behavioral ways. Uh, but I often find that there is certainly a physical component to those symptoms of pain and withdrawal. Um, withdrawal that um, are always difficult to tease apart. Um, I also, you know, see so many adolescents and young adults who completely want to disengage and sleep and, you know, in some cases that's adaptive. Um, you know, if we all thought about feeling that bad, we'd probably want to sleep um, through it as well. So it's, it's often something that alarms people if a patient's sleeping a lot. Um, and I think it's just important to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis and really recognize is, is this disengagement and potentially sleeping a lot, is it impacting relationships or medical care or mood? Um, you know, but if the patient 
can sleep and really identify that that's a, an adaptive coping mechanism for me that really helps me function better when I'm awake, then I think it's okay to, to really support that as one of the um, coping mechanisms of the adolescent or young adult. Um, you know, the danger is the, the more you sleep and the more you disengage, the more you're likely to become depressed and anxious. So it can be a vicious cycle that really needs to be monitored. Um, I put distraction as key because, um, you know, it's so important, especially when AYA are feeling so lousy to think, what are the simple things in life that can really help them refocus and not engage so much in the physical discomfort that they're you're experiencing, you know, and that's simple things like um, things to do on the computer, favorite movies, um, art projects, uh, you know, if, if they're involved in school or trying to keep up with a job, you know, helping them stay focused on that, um, even in little snippets. So really thinking of what are the, the coping, the external coping mechanisms, um, and, and distractions that can help refocus. Um, and as I mentioned before, again, follow your instincts and advocate if you really think something's wrong or um, you're hearing from from the medical team that you know they're saying that your child may be depressed or anxious because they're really having these symptoms of unknown etiology and you have a sense that something's really wrong, you know, speak up because oftentimes parents know best and it really helps to hear um, to hear you advocate on their behalf in those instances when the your AYA child just really can't speak up for themselves. Okay. And then long term, <clears throat> some of you may be facing this um, if you have long term survivors. Um, if your children are long term survivors and that is late effects. So Unfortunately, you finish the cancer treatment and then you may have to um, monitor for and deal with the long-term physical effects of treatment. Um, and it could, you know, the treatment, whether it's chemotherapy or radiation, can affect any organ system. So it's really a, an unfortunate burden of surviving childhood cancer. And we know that approximately 75% are dealing with, of long-term survivors are dealing with late effects and over half have some kind of cognitive or learning impairment um, from their treatment. And what to do to manage these problems? Um, you know, health promotion is so key. Uh, when patients are on treatment, everybody's in survival mode, especially the, the parents, as I said. And then when treatment ends, it's kind of like this sigh of relief. But really, it's a wonderful opportunity for um, AYA to, to learn to value their bodies and their health in a way that AYA typically don't. And really, there's aspects that they have control over and you as a family have control over to promote health at that point. And that's, you know, the, the health promoting behaviors that we all engage in. So, um, you know, eating, healthy, lots of fruits and vegetables, um, avoiding health harming behaviors like smoking and alcohol and, and you know, teenagers and young adults, they experiment and they want to be normal. So it's really, um, it's difficult and shouldn't be expected to say never drink. Um, you know, don't even go to parties and tempt yourself. But it's important for them to recognize that moderation is so key. So for example, I, you know, I said drinking and they may have liver toxicity that resulted from their treatment. So their liver is already vulnerable. And then you add a lot of alcohol on top of that and it's just compromising it more. So, um, so really moderation and understanding your body and how the, the treatment impacted it is so important. Um, also critical to have follow up. So when you be, you know, become a long-term survivor you're so many years out from treatment, uh, it's important for all the patients to have annual um, follow-up care. Even when that means that 
they've aged out of the pediatric healthcare system. So really it's important to think about um, that long-term care and how to transition to the adult healthcare system and talk about it early on with your pediatric provider. Um, and then help your child become a good reporter of his or her health history. So really have it be a shared responsibility to report on um, the treatment, the, the diagnosis, and any other important information in the health history. Um, let your, your child have practice reporting on that and really keep good organized records that you share um, with your child. Adherence is such a huge issue in this age group. We know that over 50% are non-adherent, typically in that adolescent age range. And remember that when when I talked initially, they don't, adolescents have a hard time thinking of long-term consequences and they're so focused on being normal and staying integrated with um, their normal tasks of adolescence. So adherence can certainly get in the way of that. Um, and it's a very serious problem because we know that non-adherence can impact recovery and chance of relapse. When, what the research shows is actually many adolescents are non-adherent simply because they forget. Um, and other reasons for non-adherence may be just that need for control. Um, say I, I'm, I'm the boss of my body, um, this is one thing I can control, I'm not going to take that medicine. Um, and then certainly avoidance of symptoms. So, so many of these patients are taking drugs or getting treatment that make them feel lousy or look bad. And for adolescents, that's, um, you know, when they're weighing the pros and cons of that, unfortunately, they may come to the decision that it's not worth it to be taking that medication um, because they don't understand the long-term consequences. And as I said earlier, as they transition to adulthood and their brain matures, that, that changes. Um, and their experience, um, their experiences influence uh, change thoughts in that regard. So how to manage adherence problems can be really difficult, but I think it's important to explore reasons for non-adherence uh, in a non-judgmental way. So um, really validating the difficulty for adolescents and young adults to be adherent, helping them understand that this is really getting in the way of other things you want to be doing, you understand it's causing side effects, it's, you know, this is a lousy thing you have to be dealing with. And it's also hard to remember to, to be adherent sometimes. Um, and really consider the options. So, in, and this is something that's important to do perhaps with your medical team, but is that at all possible to change the regimen? Can we change the timing of a medication? Can we change the dosage? Can we spread it out in a different way? Um, can we substitute one medication for another that may have different side effects? Um, <clears throat> sometimes those are options. And then also, uh, you know, doing typical reminders, problem solving, how can I remember to take the medicine? Um, can you assign somebody to be a reminder? Can you enlist your um, child's friends to be supportive and help? Um, would notes at a certain place in the home help? Um, and certainly today there's so many apps to help with medication adherence. Um, that's definitely an option as well. <coughs> and I really want to encourage you to be honest with the medical team if you're worried that um, your your child's being not inherent or you feel like you failed your child because he or she isn't doing such a good job um, following your treatment regimen. Um, there's no shame in that. Everybody understands how, how difficult it is, especially in this age group. So um, we really encourage you to be open and honest um, and work with your medical team to, to find good solutions. And I just want to iterate, um, emphasize that in this time period, um, this transition to adulthood time period, it, we really would expect some gradual um, um, transition of responsibility. So from helping your child be adherent to 
to helping them take more responsibility, so internalize those health-related goals, and then ultimately leading to self-care and disease management as an adult. Um, so that's really something to work towards, uh, which I realize is, you know, when you're so focused on your child um, on survival and them taking every medication they need to at the right time and the right dosage, it's so hard to um, relinquish that control to really help train and coach your child to assume responsibility on their own. And this is a gradual process that takes place over years. Um, but it's something to keep in mind because really, ultimately, you do want your young adult to be able to internalize those health-related goals and value their own health and be able to engage in these health-related behaviors um, on their own. I also want to point out um, some aspects of medical decision making. We know from research that really this age group defers a lot to their caregivers to make decisions. And, and with increasing age and developmental maturity, um, that changes. It becomes more collaborative, certainly, um, for patients in their 20s. Um, but again, this is really, in, as much as parents want to assume control over this, this is. I encourage you, and we all encourage you, to really involve um, the adolescents and young adults in the medical decision making as much as possible, because ultimately they have to learn, um, again, to, to advocate for themselves, to understand what are the options, um, to weigh pros and cons. It's, you know, it's certainly a skill that they're learning, and now that they've had a diagnosis of cancer, um, you know, they're always going to have unique medical needs and need to be able to advocate for themselves and, and make some decisions as they become adults. So um, medical decision making is another area to really try and integrate um, your AYA into their care. All right, so school and learning. Um, this is another area, of course, that cancer impacts tremendously. Um, we know that school functioning is consistently rated lower compared to controls, um, that even though typically, you know, AYA are graduating from high school at rates relative to controls, following through long term with college is more difficult relative to never ill young adults, um, and they're more likely to require special education services. Um, because of the time they missed in school or because of um, cognitive impairment from their treatment. So <clears throat> what to do to manage that? I mean, I think it's, it's so important to be proactive and access all the resources and services you can. Um, if you think your child, you know, may be returning to school in six months and it's the start of a new semester, um, you know, it'll be the start of a new semester, and then be proactive and, and work on the arrangements with the school in advance. Um, you know, if it's spring and you think, I need to update my IEP, then do it before the summer because, you know, it's going to be hard to motivate the school to engage in that at the start of the next um, school year. So really be proactive and, and think ahead. Um, of course, know that there's laws in place to protect your child. Um, schools have to. They're required by law to provide accommodations for um, children and adolescents with disabilities, and that includes physical impairment or cognitive um, impairment um, related to cancer. Um, and really work with the team, you know, your medical team, social worker, psychosocial staff and the school to really think through what's best for your child, both in the short term and the long term. So um, is home tutoring or homebound a good option? Maybe cyber school, um, maybe online classes, um, or some combination of school and, and home. Um, you know, I think it's really, it's such an individual case-by-case -case basis, so really rally a lot of troops and make allies with people who can help, you know, try and have an ally within the school system and certainly, um, 
use the resources at your institution. Um, and also focus on not just reintegration um, in school, but also um, with activities and peers. So if it's really impossible for your child to be in school full time, whether it's um, high school, middle school, or, or college, or you know some other schooling, um, try and see if you know your child is willing and able, and also the school is willing and able to have you know to have them involved in some activities. So it may be that. Um, they go to pep rally or an assembly at school or they go to one period each day um, because it's so important to, to keep somewhat of a connection with school but also with PRs and other um, activities of adolescence and young adulthood. And I put this up here um, to help people understand the difference between an IAP and a 504 plan. I'm not going to go through all of this but um, the IEP is um, is geared towards kindergarten through 12th grade, and it and the IEP is really intended to alter the learning environment. Um, a 504 plan can be carried through into college, and it really um, involves more minor services to help um, the the patient um, be integrated within the normal um, learning environment. Um, but you, as a parent, can request an evaluation um, and, and uh, to, to set a plan up at any point, and you can also request that they be updated at any point. Um, also keep in mind, if, if you're concerned about special um, accommodations for college entrance exams, plan, plan ahead. It takes a very long time to get those accommodations in place. You know, for example, extra time on the SATs. It requires a lot of documentation, a lot of um, jumping through hoops and, um, you know, really think ahead about how is what my child is dealing with now and some of the cognitive limitations that they're already facing. Um, going to impact those long-term academic goals. Um, I also want to remind everyone that if you go to the CHOP website, you can see there's a printout of um, scholarships for um, adolescents and young adults who have cancer or survived cancer. And also keep in mind that for colleges, there's the Office of Disabilities there to help. Um, uh, we, you know, and, the one thing I would say is use it and um, stay um, connected to the Office of Disabilities and keep in mind that to initiate services when you start college you will need to have documentation um, of the impairment or disabilities that you want continued accommodations for in college. So, so keep good records and you know again this is an area where some advocacy may be involved but um, usually you know, it's a good thing to be working with the Office of Disabilities at school. All right, so we're at a point where um, uh, we could have a break for questions. Um, okay, so my 16-year-old definitely wants to keep everything normal. He doesn't really want to focus on the cancer. He is usually in good spirits, but I'm concerned that he doesn't talk about the cancer. Should I keep encouraging him to talk about it or let him bring it up in his own time? Um, so I would say let him bring it up in his own time. If his mood is good and he's engaged in activities um, that represent normal for him um, and he's not avoiding cancer um, to the point where he's not engaged in his medical care, he's not doing the things he needs to do for his treatment or to stay healthy, um, you know, that's all good. So he's, he's integrated the cancer into his normal life and he's able to move on and stay engaged in his normal life. And honestly, that's what we want. Um, you know, if somebody, if you said that he wasn't talking about the cancer and you could tell it was really impacting him like he was disengaged, he was not taking his medication, he um, was not doing things he typically enjoyed, then 
I would be concerned. Um, then there's something certainly about that cancer experience that is um, significantly impacting him, and um, and we need to, to do something to draw that out of him and better understand it. But it sounds like you have a very resilient 16-year-old. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so my 15-year-old was told that because of being heavily treated twice now, he needs to eat a heart-healthy diet as chemo and radiation may have affected his heart. No matter how much I try to encourage healthier eating and regular activity, he is very resistant and said he would rather play video games than be active as it is too tiring. How hard should we be pushing these things? Um, so it's hard to say without really understanding the full significance of... of um, of this patient's uh, physical status. Um, I'm wondering if you've seen nutrition at your institution. Um, sometimes they have really creative ways to help patients eat better um, in ways that are appealing to adolescents. But again, this is what's so challenging about adolescents. And you go back to typical adolescent development, they don't understand the long-term implications because they may just not have um, the brain maturation to really think through some of these complex issues of how his behavior now is could impact his health later. Um, I think it's so important for parents to model um, appropriate behavior, and, and maybe you're doing a wonderful job of that. Um, but doing activities as a family, um, cooking meals together that are healthy, um, and and providing some rewards. So. You may think that this should be obvious for your 15-year-old, um, but it may not be. Maybe your 15-year-old still needs some external rewards for doing some activity or eating a healthy meal once a day, um, or whatever those rewards may be, whether it's um, extra privileges or you know something he wants to save up for. Um, but it, you know, just keep in mind it's so challenging to understand um, why somebody who seems so mature and grown up in so many ways just wouldn't get that he needs to he needs to be more healthy and not be so sedentary. So I really emphasize with you. And again, um, hopefully, whether you're a top patient somewhere else, there's some resources to help. Um, you know, by way of nutrition and maybe psych psychology and some psychosocial support. All right, so socially, this is so challenging for this age group because this is a time where um, peers and individuation from their family of origin is so key but yet they're so hindered in their ability to do that when they're on treatment or when they're off treatment and have gotten to a point of feeling left out and disengaged from their peers and really out of the loop. Um, so what to do? Um, and this goes back to, um, I think we had uh, an, er yeah, an earlier question about keeping them engaged with friends. I often encourage adolescents and young adults who, you know, in their their normal lives when they're not feeling so lousy or maybe before the cancer, um, you know, they, there's so many ways to keep in touch with friends these days, you know, they're texting, their Facebook, whatever, Instagram, um, sometimes the phone or email still, but, you know, use those methods to stay in touch. and. So many times, even if a patient feels so lousy, they may just ignore texts for a day. Um, I try to encourage them, like, even I, I get it, you feel so lousy, you don't even want to push any button on your phone, but it's so important to provide some reinforcement to those friends for reaching out. So even if you text back, hey, appreciate the message, feeling lousy, give me some time to get back to you. That goes a long way. Um, and I think it's important for them to realize, the patients, that 
their friends on the other end have no idea what's going on. And unless you've experienced cancer yourself or a close family member, you know, they have no idea how complex your life is right now or how lousy you may feel. Um, so the, you know, you run the risk if you don't stay in touch with them, they may take it personally or disengage. And, you know, they're just a teenager with the same immature brain that, you know, we've been describing, you know, uh, just like, you know, your adolescents and young adults, they may not understand. Um, and I think as adults, we understand that, but the AYA patient may not. So I think it's really important to help them just keep in touch, even just one little text or one little status update on Facebook um, or an email back saying, hey, guy, or email, give me some time to get back to you. Um, because ultimately you don't want your friends to go away. And um, and it's important for AOA to realize that they need, you know, it's only gonna help them to have, to maintain some connection with friends. The other important thing to think about is there's so many other ways to keep, to connect with other AOA patients. So, um, you know, unfortunately, there are instances where they do just feel so disconnected from their peers and it's difficult to maintain relationships. And sometimes the best thing to do is to feel connected with other peers who have been through the same thing they have. And I'm going to refer you back to the CHOP website because there's a wonderful resource list of AYA resources. But there are certainly organizations that focus on adolescents and young adults um, where they do social aid outings or they have listservs and um, you know, stories to review on, you know, that you can relate to. So also an important resource. Um, and then I want to point out that long term, it's really this cancer experience may impact how adolescents and young adults um, think about who they are and their identity development and how they relate to others and what they want to disclose about their cancer history. And I want to emphasize that there's no right or wrong answer. Um, sometimes they just want to put it past them and move on and not be that patient with cancer anymore. And other times they really embrace it as part of their identity. And whatever works. I mean, you know, it's, 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 you have, everybody's different. And, um, and I would just help your, your patient, your child embrace what works for them. Um, cause usually they find a good fit of how they want that cancer to be part of their identity. Um, and it's, and they work through that issue and, and find what works for them. Um, certainly a uh, body appearance and self-esteem is another concern. Um, and I just want to emphasize two things. I, I am mindful of the time here and that is, you know, of course, encouraging exploration of wigs and scarves and new styles is important. And also there's a lot of research to support that physical activity, um, especially after treatment, can help um, AYA feel good about their body again. Um, fertility and sexuality is also a huge issue for this age group. They, um, a lot of them express a lot of confusion, a lot of unmet needs related to this topic. Um, I think a lot of them want more information and don't quite understand the implications of what's going on. So I think it's important to, to think of this as on a case-by-case -case basis and really collaborate with your medical team and, and um, your medical provider about how and when to disclose issues of infertility um, with uh, the AYA patient. Um, you know, if they got diagnosed recently in this age group, then it's probably relevant. They've already had discussions, but if their treatment happened a long time, if the initial diagnosis was a long time ago, um, you know, and, and there's, they may not have understood the implications of, of infertility once they started treatment. Another thing to keep in mind is differing coping styles. Um, your teenager or young adult may, um, may be an information seeker or an avoider. 
you may want that information. You may feel the need to disclose a lot of information. Um, or it could be the reverse. You could be somebody who's extremely private and want to um, kind of avoid the topic. And on the flip side, your teenager or young adult is really feeling the need to get a lot of information, do research on the internet, talk to people about it. Um, so I just encourage you to keep in mind that coping styles differ among family members and oftentimes that causes tension and distress. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, I have some slides on post-traumatic stress and there's actually a talk recently, um, another webinar on post-traumatic stress that you can see on the CHOP website. So I'm not gonna get into this in detail. Um, what I do wanna point out is it's actually a long-term issue for young adult survivors. So not so much an issue for teenagers, um, but the long-term survivors do have um, an increase in post-traumatic stress symptoms. And that really has to do with what we were talking about in the beginning, and that's the increase in experience, the, the increased understanding of implications of what happened to them, that ability to engage in abstract thinking. So it's really that cognitive maturity that helps them put into perspective the trauma that they've experienced and the implications of it. And from that leads to an increase in traumatic stress. What do you do about a young adult who isn't getting his scans regularly? He has a huge chance of relapse, but he doesn't like me bugging him to make appointments. He is now two months past when he should have had his last scans. Um, gosh, this is so challenging because you have a patient who's really, you have a child who's a young adult really asserting their autonomy and making a choice that um, it's my life and I'm not prioritizing this right now. But clearly, um, it may not be the most rational decision. It may not be what you as a parent want. Um, so I really empathize with you. Um, you know, this happens in adult medicine all the time. But when it's a patient that you experienced cancer with, um, you know, as a parent, it's, it's a whole set of challenges. Um, there's no easy answer. I think, again, it's hard to answer this question about really understanding what's going on and what, what's motivating your child to avoid um, the scans, but talking with the medical team, people who know your child, who may be able to reach your, this patient um, in ways that you can, I think, again, mobilize your resources um, and, and see if other people have some insight that you may be missing. Um, my 16 year old had a large circle of friends prior to diagnosis after he was just charged from the hospital he had his first girlfriend it has become so serious so quickly and he doesn't see his other friends as much I know it's important for him to have someone to talk to during this time but it seems too intense for his age is this usual with AYA cancer patients and is healthy for his recovery um, you know I think <laughs> This is probably not that uncommon for any 16 year old in their first relationship. Um, I think your concerns are valid that um, he just came from, um, yeah, yeah, so he, um, he went through this period where he was somewhat disengaged from friends and, and as a parent, you know the best thing to do is to reintegrate with a lot of different social networks and, and sources of social support. Um, so I validate your concern. Um, I think this is probably very typical of a 16 year old and a relationship, um, in a new relationship. Again, think back to what are the developmental tasks of adolescents. Um, and one of them is exploring intimate relationships. So it's certainly a challenge. Um, I think the, the best thing to do is continue to do what you can to encourage contact with friends. Um, but it's also wonderful that he's got a close relationship right now and um, a trusted companion. Okay, 
One other thing I want to touch upon, so I just mentioned um, AYA goals. Um, and we think about how the cancer impacts development. I spoke earlier about, you know, it's impacting individuation um, from parents, it's impacting the ability to have satisfying relationships, um, meet academic goals. And what I, I refer to that as health-related hindrance. So the idea that, you know, something about your health and that you're, the treatment you're receiving is impacting your personal goals. Um, and what, what's important to note here is that adolescent and young adult goals, when you study them, um, AYA with, with cancer, their goals are not different from uh, AYA who have never had cancer, never had a chronic illness. Um, again, they're in the mode where I want to be normal, this is what I'm prioritizing. So if you compare their goals on these different um, topics, so academic, occupational, health-related goals, body appearance goals, they're really quite similar. Um, the difference, of course, is that AYA with cancer are in endorsed that their health gets in the way of these goals significantly. So this just shows the blue, it shows you health-related hindrance, how pain, fatigue, other symptoms, and health behaviors impact their goals relative to controls. So it's a significant problem. And we know that that is a huge marker of poor quality of life, of distress, of negative affect. And what can you do? I think really operationalizing what are your child's goals, and not just for yourself, but for the medical team. So helping them understand, helping, you know, you understanding, helping the medical team understand that these aspects of my child's development are so important to him or her. Um, what can we do to support them? So sometimes you can help your child work towards their goals. It may be possible with, um, specific resources, maybe you could tweak a medical regimen in some way. Um, and, 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 you know, so it's important to recognize what's realistic and what's not. And if it's not realistic, how can you gently reframe a goal? Um, you may need support from psychosocial staff to do that, to really help you and your child and your family through this, but really thinking, okay, if getting to the end of my high school year and graduating on time isn't feasible, what is? What can I work towards that's realistic? Maybe it's engaging with your friends in some end of the year activities. Still, of course, disappointing, but the more you can help shape that goal early on um, and prepare for the disappointment of the other goal not happening, the better. Um, and ultimately, you're adapting to that health-related hindrance. Okay, so some concluding messages. Um, you know, we really emphasize the immaturity of adolescents in that time of transition to young adulthood. So your child, this adolescent, young, emerging adult may be so mature in so many ways, but keep in mind that they still have a relatively immature brain that's, that's keeping them emotionally dysregulated, um, difficult to, um, to stay focused, engage in abstract thinking, think of long-term consequences. So all of that clearly adds to the challenge of parenting an adolescent with cancer. Also to keep in mind, AYA want to be normal, so maintain normalcy as much as possible. Don't be afraid to continue to have the same rules and limitations. Um, you know, your expectations for their behavior are the same now as it was before cancer. You know, of course, to, to the best of your ability, there may be exceptions to that, but um, as much as you can, maintain the same rules and limits. Um, and the same rules and tasks within your family as well, and schedules and activities. So, so, you know, I can't reiterate that enough. Like, maintain normalcy, that supports your patients, the AYA's goals for normalcy, and may um, help uh, minimize the stress in the family as well. Also, it's such a struggle for parents in this, um, with patients, with children in this age range, but you know, the importance of letting go. And I emphasized this before, but really knowing that the best thing you can do for your child is to really help them internalize those health um, 
behaviors that will carry them into adulthood. Um, and we know that that's challenging. We got the question about a young adult who's not getting their scans. Um, so the more you can help early on the patient assume some responsibility, be engaged in their care, um, advocate for themselves better. And communication is key, so don't forget to have conversations with your child about their goals, their fears, their coping styles, medical decisions and medical history, all the things I've touched upon already. And we know from research that more open communication relates to better quality of life, better adaption, and better adherence. And finally, I realize all of this is easier said than done. I don't take for granted that this is hard. Um, for all of you. You've been thrown into extraordinary circumstances um, and you deserve a lot of credit for what you've, what you've managed thus far and just signing on to this webinar shows that you're really trying to mobilize your resources and get as much information as possible and that's a really good sign. Um, and really know that you need to take care of yourself. It sounds cliche but it's so important. You know, recognize what are your own goals and what are the things you want to strive for? What's realistic in your life, given the circumstances? And what are some of the, your distractions that help you cope? Um, and just don't be afraid to access resources and share your concerns, both at the institution and in your social network um, and with the medical team. And to end on a positive note, um, as I said, I work a lot with adolescents and young adults on treatment and long-term survivors and you know in my experience and the research shows that most long-term survivors are doing amazingly well they're so adaptive and um, they people ultimately learn to grow from the experience and and understand some benefits of having been through cancer so they're hopefully as late at the end of the tunnel all right a few more questions Okay, I have a 21-year-old who was just diagnosed. He doesn't want to tell all of his friends and is worried about people pitying him or feeling sorry for him. Right now, he lives away from home by himself, and I'm worried as much about his mental health as his physical health. Do you recommend we look into counseling? <clears throat> so, um, so I'm going to say this is, I'm going to normalize this again, because if you remember, this age group, they just want to be normal. So disclosing this to their friends isn't normal. That's That sets them apart. Um, but I'm also going to normalize your concerns that um, it may not be a long-term positive strategy to feel so disengaged um, and not disclose this to friends. Um, sometimes what, so could counseling help? Yeah. Um, sometimes what I do with this age group is help them understand that if you're not disclosing some of this really important stuff in your life to your friends, then that um, can sometimes be interpreted as personally offensive to the friends. So if the tables were reversed and um, you had a good friend who had just got diagnosed with cancer and was going through it and that person didn't tell you, how would it make you feel? So sometimes they can, if you, if you help them understand the friend's perspective, it may make them more willing to be open with them, you know, and they don't need to tell everybody, but if they have a few close friends, then um, it can really benefit them and the relationship in the long term from disclosing. Um, I have four grandchildren, Lee Fraumini syndrome. My eight-year-old granddaughter um, has adrenal cancer and sarcoma. My daughter has breast cancer. How can I help all of them deal with the future issues that will develop? Um, so challenging. Um, this is this is actually a really new area um, of research and and of um, a new area that's where the need for support is becoming um, increasingly recognized. And the reason being, of course, is with more and more genetic testing and understanding of the implications of the testing and positive outcomes. Um, you know, it's, it's heightening awareness um, and distress uh, for some of these families. So it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, you know, your concern is really valid and important. Um, sometimes 
uh, you asked how can I deal with all of them with future issues that will develop. Um, you know, this is really complex and getting professional support, you know, is something I would recommend. But, you know, also keep in mind that for these complex, these families with complex genetic syndromes, people in the family cope with it very differently. So some people want to tuck it away and not focus on it, and others really incorporate that into part of their identity and how they develop their goals and, and are really engaged in medical surveillance. So, you know, it's really hard to know what the right um, coping mechanism is for the different members of your family, but just know that they're, they may each deal with it in their own different adaptive ways. Um, but I would encourage some professional support because there's a lot going on. Um, and you're right, this is a challenge um, to support all these, these medically vulnerable people in your family. Okay, thank you so much. These questions were wonderful. I'm happy to share some of these issues with you that um, I know we just touched on the surface, but hopefully it provided um, some food for thought. Thank you.